Welcome to this edition of IBFD's Tax Takes News and Views, bringing you the week's tax news in a nutshell. I'm Barry Larkin, Special Counsel at IBFD, and with me for our Beyond the News interview is Stuart Gibson, IBFD's Chief Editor, Global News in Washington, D.C. On today's show, investing in Russia is about to get more expensive. 49 tax regimes get a thumbs up in the OECD's latest review, and Greece starts offering more than just cut price holidays. These are more coming up on IBFD's Tax Takes, including Stuart Gibson's interview with Bob Stack, Managing Director International Tax in the Washington National Tax Practice at Deloitte. Bob was formerly a U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Tax Affairs and will no doubt have some useful tips on how President-elect Biden might address global tax reform. First, we turn to the top news of the past week, as reported in IBFD's tax news service. Russia has found a creative way to raise some badly needed revenue by negotiating higher withholding tax rates under some of its tax treaties. Luxembourg is the latest in a string of treaty partners to approve such changes that would introduce 15% withholding tax rates for most dividends and interest and replace the current lower or even zero rates under those treaties. Russia has clearly not picked the countries at random, targeting those used as platforms for inbound investment into Russia, such as Cyprus and Malta and now Luxembourg, with more in the pipeline. Russia is unlikely to be on the losing end of these deals for two reasons. First, these treaty partners often have no domestic withholding, and second, there is little outbound investment from Russia into these countries. The Russian government is not just looking at tax treaties to raise more revenue. Starting in January, it will also replace the current flat income tax rate for individuals with a progressive tax system. While that may sound revolutionary, the change will probably not prompt people like French actor Gérard Depardieu to return their Russian passports. That's because the base rate will remain at 13, yes, 13 percent for income up to around 50,000 euros and rise to just 15 percent for income above that amount. The OECD has just released its latest review of tax incentives around the world. The review aims to assess whether the benefits being offered by a country are considered harmful under the OECD's BEPS Action 5 guidelines. This is a peer review process and the penalties for failure are essentially limited to being publicly named and the risk of countermeasures from other countries. The good news is that all 49 regimes that were reviewed this year have passed the test one way or another. But that still leaves another 12 that are either under review or have been found harmful. A different set of 12, no or only nominal tax jurisdictions, formerly known as tax havens, have all passed the test, according to the report. EU tax advisors and other intermediaries are not the only ones struggling with new rules for reporting aggressive tax planning arrangements. And while some countries outside the EU seem to be taking their time, others have moved rapidly to adopt mandatory disclosure rules. One such country is Mexico, where such rules will kick in from next year, and the Mexican Tax Administration has just published details of exactly what must be disclosed and how. Argentina has also recently introduced similar rules, but it remains to be seen whether other countries in Latin America will follow their lead. There are no prizes for guessing what the next hot topic in the tax world will be, with both the IRS and the OECD having recently published long reports on crypto assets, such as bitcoins and the like. While those reports focus on how crypto assets should be taxed, as well as their potential for tax evasion, the EU has announced plans that target the evasion risk. If adopted, these proposals would mean more reporting by intermediaries and more information exchange between EU tax administrations. Denmark has joined the climate change train and has just released its own green tax reform plans. While the planet may be the ultimate beneficiary, in the short term, businesses will benefit from more generous depreciation rules, as well as incentives for green investments. The sting in the tail is that businesses will be hit with higher energy taxes. This first phase of the Danish plans is designed to kickstart the green transition and create more jobs in the coming years. And now moving on to other news. Mexico is again in the news this week for having updated its somewhat metaphysical sounding list of taxpayers presumed to have entered into non-existent transactions. Being put on the list means that taxpayers will have to prove that the transactions did occur or otherwise file an amended return. Yet another example of how blacklists are being used to encourage compliance. 
And speaking of blacklists, starting next year, Hungary will no longer exempt companies from its controlled foreign company rules if they're based in jurisdictions on the EU's blacklist. In so doing, Hungary joins a growing number of EU member states that are introducing these kinds of defensive measure against blacklisted jurisdictions. And finally, if you only think of Greece in the context of cut price holidays, think again, as Greece will be offering a 50% tax cut to individuals who move to Greece for business or employment reasons beginning next month. Terms and conditions apply. Now we go beyond the news for Stuart Gibson's interview with Bob Stack. Stuart. Thank you, Barry, for your informative news report. I'm Stuart Gibson, Chief Editor of Global News here at IBFD. I'm joined today by Bob Stack, Managing Director of International Tax in the Washington National Tax Practice at Deloitte. Welcome, Bob. Great to be here. Thank you. Uh, Bob, in a career filled with highlights, you're probably best known for serving as the point person for the Obama administration on the OECD's BEPS project. Your last day in government, and I want to say so far, was January 20, 2017. Where did things stand with the U.S. and the BEPS inclusive framework when you walked out the door on your last day at Treasury? Yeah, thank you for the question, Stuart. You know, as I look back at that period, um, the BEPS reports had come out in uh, October of 15. Um, and then the election, our election obviously was in 16, but a lot of the BEPS stuff really hit the ground running. Uh, I double checked the uh, ATAD proposal came out in the European Union in January of 16, which implemented a series of the BEPS moves. The um, multilateral instrument work was ongoing and was going to survive our administration to get that both drafted and then ratified around the world. We had several projects that left were left over from BEPS, one on interest for banks, one on um, attribution of profits to a permanent establishment, one on profit splits. So that, that work kind of continued and was uh, still ongoing when I went out. But the biggest one really was the continuation of the digital work. Um, you know, in, in the, I was the co-chair of the digital task force in the, during BEPS one with my former French counterpart, Edouard Marcus. And, you know, there was a lot of, I would say what's talked about later of, dissatisfaction, particularly among European governments, that we hadn't done, quote, more uh, to, to tame, you know, the taxation of the digital economy. But we did produce a report that asked for a status update in 2020, uh, and we made a few other recommendations on digital. But no sooner were we out the door as an administration when the German presidency of the G20, uh, led by Finance Minister Schäuble, wanted to put digital, keep it high up on the G20 agenda, notwithstanding that we had just done a fair amount of work on digital. And I pulled up that communique from March of 2017, where they said that they would further do work on the digital issue through the task force on the digital economy. And then they asked for an interim report by the IMF um, and the and Working Party 6 in for the spring meetings of 2018. I'm sorry, they asked for an interim report from the OECD for the spring meetings of 2018. And what that did was it put in motion where we are in digital today. That is to say, the OECD set out on a path to do a, an interim report that set the path for pillar one and two. And the EU itself kept the ball by looking out for some of its own directives uh, and direction to take the work in. Now, it was not a huge surprise that Germany kept digital on the agenda. As the presidency of the G20, they would have had a lot of sway over what was going to be in that March communique. Um, and, and also, and it would have been very difficult to prevent digital from continuing to be an issue uh, in the G20. Um, and also, the Germans, of course, were trying to kind of woo the French uh, as Brexit was happening. And so they had to kind of give something to the French and the French were all hepped up on the digital project. So it, it really never left the stage and we're living with that uh, aftermath all the way through the reports just issued in October on Pillars 1 and Pillars 2. So uh, there's a lot of continuation going on. So this has a long history uh, <clears throat> and with the uh, G20 and the OECD. So as we record this interview, President Trump still refuses to concede that he lost the election. 
President-elect Biden has now begun the formal transition, and just today he formally announced Vice, uh, former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen as his Secretary of the Treasury. Now, it's going to take a while for her, once confirmed, to fully staff up the department, and of course the key roles are uh, Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy. What qualities do you think she and President-elect Biden should be looking for in the people that they will appoint to represent the United States in the global tax discussions with OECD? Yeah, so I think I, I kind of, this is a quasi-joking answer, but I think having a thick skin is one quality that uh, that somebody definitely needs. Um, you have to appreciate that when I was doing the work on digital, for example, the United States led the world in the digital economy work. There was a, a big perception in the US government that a lot of this was aimed at the US tech giants and other countries were not necessarily putting their industries or their tax base on the line. And when you get in the room, uh, there's a lot of other country that, that would like to tax those companies, but you're kind of in that sense isolated as the US company leads that leads in tech. So you do need to have a thick skin as you deal with the, the processes. Um, I do think more seriously, you need a good international technical tax base. You know, it, it, it's a lot of the policy issues. Yes, they're broad policy issues and you want them to be simple and administrable, but at the same time, you really do have to understand the plumbing to be able to, you know, to design these things. Um, I think that you do need the ability to listen to a variety of stakeholders, both within the U.S., whether that's business communities, NGOs, and others uh, working with the Hill to just be able to absorb the different perspectives that people have and don't get too locked in on your own uh, on your own view. And then I think people have a great appreciation if you are listening and trying to take different points of view in, into your work. That relates to another quality that I cared a lot about, which was transparency. Um, you know, I, I thought that as a government servant, it was important to share with the stakeholders our, our honest views about issues as they were moving along so that they could actively engage with us. In other words, if you're always hiding the ball, you're not going to get that cross-pollination from good, thoughtful people on the outside about the direction you're taking. And that does uh, demand a certain degree of uh, transparency. I tip my hat to my successor, Chip Harder, in that regard, because I think he also uh, demonstrated that in all of his work uh, over the last several years uh, on BEPS. Um, you do have to have a realistic view of the competing national interests. You know, the OECD is a funny place because on the one hand, you're trying to come up with broad general rules that are good for the system. But on the other hand, countries are, are looking out to protect their own tax base and, and, and have rules that are in their own interest. And I don't think I don't think we can be naive about that. So you want to be open, but you need to be, I think, uh, savvy and realistic about uh, different ways that 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 people uh, in, in these other countries are, are going to um, attack these issues. It's a very challenging for somebody like myself who grew up in a um, technical tax environment. It was a very different environment to be in this kind of global setting uh, negotiating all these things. So you kind of do need to be able to switch uh, that skill set. The last point I'll make is, uh, and this is something I learned in government, you, you do need somebody who's going to have the greatest respect for the professional staff at Treasury. There's a series of just wonderful economists that work there, and also the legal staff, the International Tax Council staff, um, that support all the work we did in international tax. They're bright, they're wonderful, engaged, and you do need a personality who can kind of, kind of mesh with the professional staff, and including at the IRS, as you work through these issues going forward, a very, I think, important skill that I think uh, someone in that job should have. Wow, that's uh, that's quite a uh, quite a set of job qualifications. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that uh, when President Biden takes the oath on January 20 next year, global tax reform is not going to be anywhere near the top of his agenda. He'll be dealing with the pandemic, the rollout of the vaccines, dealing with the economic collapse, climate change immigration, pulling back some of the executive actions of his predecessor, and yet you have the clock is ticking. You have the G25 finance ministers meeting in February. Uh, you have the European Union has said the drop dead date for the OECD 
the to act is July of next year. How would you, oh, and then plus you have the pressures of the French with the digital services tax that is going to start being collected in December. You have U.S. retaliatory tariffs that may take effect before uh, President Biden is sworn in. How would you, what advice would you give to President-elect Biden as to how to address the tax challenges and given how full his plate will be, how to prioritize them? Yeah, that's a really great question. And you're making an obvious point, which is that you don't really get to say, I've got all these other things to do. I'll just ignore the tax thing, because as you pointed out, you got the finance ministers, the June deadline. Um, I think the first reality that has to be dealt with is the, the question of the DSTs, the digital services taxes. They're in place. The French are doing it. The UK is doing it. We actually have tariffs set to go into effect with the French in early January before President-elect Biden takes office. Um, and we've got, as we speak today, uh, nine other investigations going on under the U.S. by the U.S. Trade Representative. And so you can't ignore those issues. And I think it'll be important for the administration, not necessarily to follow through on any specific uh, point of action, but to recognize that the DSTs are there to be engaged with because they're coming at us now. We can expect more of them down the road as governments believe that tech is is making out well during COVID and as governments are going to need more revenue for COVID. I single out the DSTs because I think the DST agenda is separate and apart from the pillar one and pillar two agenda. And the reason I say that is the DSTs are coming at us now. Pillar one and two, even if if fully agreed in 2021, which is not likely, um, won't be implemented for several years. I sometimes handicap it at 2024, 25. So you have this mismatch in timing that I think suggests there should be kind of two paths of engagement, one for the DSTs, one for pillar one and pillar two. Now you mentioned the EU and um, all I would say there is you're right, they're waiting, but there is also a broader opportunity for the Biden administration to re-engage with the EU. And I think there'll be some appetite on a broad variety of issues. There was a piece in the Financial Times this morning on this um, that could include DSTs and digital going forward, but there's just so much more on the trade agenda that that could be a, a fruitful opportunity to re-engage with the EU around a series of issues. Now on pillar one and pillar two, um, the, my first piece of advice would be um, not to feel tied down by the artificial deadline set by the G20. Um, th there was a deadline originally of end of 19, then the deadline for political agreement was mid 2020, then it was the end of 2020. And one could make the case that by continuing to try to rush down the road to get to agreement, we're kind of tripping all over each other because there are enormous technical issues and incredible political issues that just are not getting solved. One of the things I think is important uh, for your audience to appreciate is there's a lot of talk about how the U.S. is the stumbling block uh, at the OECD, whether it's because they wanted to uh, slow things down because of COVID or because the Treasury Secretary proposed a, a safe harbor approach to Pillar 1. But the truth is, as you work through the documents, there are many, many areas where there is not political agreement yet and many different groups that have a lot of views. And so I think what you need to do is step back now, if, if I were coming in new, I would say, don't be afraid to chart new territory. If these ideas are not gaining ground or they seem to be kind of limping in terms of the principles underlying them, uh, certainly an opportunity for new thinking to be done. Um, you might also have to, th you will also have to think a lot about how you get the US Congress working in lockstep with the executive. And this is not just a partisan issue. In any administration, the executive and the legislature in this country operate very independently from each other, as does each house. And so if, you, if you're going to be treasury and commit the US government abroad, you need some assurance that Congress will go along with a commitment or you can't make the commitment. The example I often like to use is when when we agreed in BEPS to do country by country reporting, we agreed because we had the regulatory authority to, uh, to do country by country reporting without a new statute. But if we had needed a new statute, 
we probably couldn't have committed to it as a minimum standard. And that tension uh, will remain in the work. My last thought is, you know, they've done a lot of technical work. We've got over 500 pages of technical stuff, but we haven't spent enough time simply saying, hey, let's get everybody in the room and say, what are the 15 to 20 political sticking points? What is the horse trading? Will this group of countries be, give, be willing to give more certainty if we give a little more margin in amount B? Or And there's myriad trade-offs in there and, and a number of political issues. But I think at the end of the day, we probably should just get everybody in a room and see if there is a path forward at the OECD for a political agreement. And if there's not, we should recognize it. And if there is, we should stay at it. But I think the harder work is the political work, not necessarily keep churning out the technical papers. So a very tall order uh, coming down the pike for the new administration. Well, from, from what I hear you saying, that US leadership and engagement is desperately needed uh, in order to see the project through, either to success or in this iteration or some other iteration. And if the US is willing to fully engage with its partners around the world on this, then there is an opportunity for breathing room and we shouldn't get so hung up on deadlines. And it seems to me those are really, really good pieces of advice. I want to say, Bob, that the new administration would certainly benefit from your experience and your steady hand. Uh, I don't want to uh, prejudge anything, but but it seems to me uh, uh, the work that you've done would be, uh, would be uh, uh, very well appreciated uh, going forward by the new administration. Um, no need to answer. Um, our guest today has been Bob Stack, former U.S. Deputy Assistant Treasury Secretary for International Tax Affairs and now managing partner at Deloitte and Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks for having me, Stuart. Uh, that wraps up this week's edition of Tax Takes News and Views, the week's tax news in a nutshell. From Barry Larkin and myself, thank you for watching. Here's hoping your week is not too taxing.